Jan Wenner, or Jan Wenner, who, who co-founded both Rolling Stone magazine and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, has been unseated from the Hall of Fame's board of directors after this interview with the New York Times was released this week. So they released it in written form. They also released it in audio form. He has a book out called Masters, which is interviews with the most influential rock stars uh, of his heyday. And it just so happens that uh, he picked seven white men to interview. There were no people of color or no women uh, as part of this book. And so the New York Times asked him about this. This was released as an audio podcast in conjunction with the article. So we're going to listen to this excerpt here. Listen to his explanation for why seven white men uh, and exclusively seven white men were featured uh, in this upcoming book. Seven white, seven subjects in the book, seven white guys. Yep. In the introduction to the book, you acknowledge that, say, you know, uh, performers of color and and uh, women performers just not in your zeitgeist. I think is the phrase you use, mm-hmm. which, to my mind, is not plausible for Jan Wenner to say. Janis Joplin, Joni Mitchell, Stevie Nicks, Stevie Wonder. I, you know, the list keeps going. Not in your zeitgeist. What do you think is the deeper explanation for why you interviewed the subjects you interviewed and not other subjects? Well, let me just, I, I get the Carol King, me, Madonna. I mean, there's a, there's a million pe- examples. Okay. I, um, when I was referring to this, I was referring to black performers, uh, not to the female performers. Okay. So just to get that accurate. Um, it's just weird. I mean, we'll let this play in a minute. Um, because this was released in written form. But when you hear it, you really hear the awkwardness in his voice. So the seven uh, artists who are featured in this book are Bob Dylan, John Lennon, Mick Jagger, Pete Townshend, Jerry Garcia, Bono, and Bruce Springsteen. Now, I mean, look, this, this is far from a woke show. Everybody knows that. But that's what's interesting, because Rolling Stone has become a very woke lib magazine and here is the founder trying to explain why seven white guys were in his book saying that um he didn't feel uh like the zeitgeist was really captured by black performers or to a certain even though he kind of walks it back women performers too as if women's lib and black empowerment were not zeitgeist themes of the checks notes 1960s (laughs) Nineteen sixties <laughs> and early nineteen seventies. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? They weren't they weren't tapped into the zeitgeist. That's everything that was fucking going on back then. It was the, that was the whole culture back then. What Bono had his finger on the pulse of the moment more than fucking Janis Joplin or Marvin Gaye. Hello, no. I mean, mercy, mercy me, inner city blues. What's got that whole album was a zeitgeist album. There's no other way to describe that album than a zeitgeist album. So what the fuck is he even talking about? Do you have anything to add before we play the rest of this? No, nah, let's play the, I, I'll save it for the end. Okay. okay. All right. Here we go. Ugh. Warren, the rules of improv, Uncle Warren, always say no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got something good. I promise. Don't okay. worry. Gotcha. All right. Here we go. In terms of the female performance, I mean, the selection was not a deliberate selection. It was kind of intuitive over the years. It just fell together that way. You know? So I interviewed the people I interviewed had to meet a couple of criteria. One, just kind of my personal interest and love of them, you know? But having to do with. And it's a hard one to exactly express. Hold on a second. The helicopter is going by. Yeah, we cut around that. Insofar as women, I mean, there were just none of them were as articulate enough on this intellectual level. Oh, oh. stop it. You can't say that. Great answer. You're, you're telling <laughs> Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Great answer. That's what I was waiting for. I was waiting for him to. Like, That's what he came up with while me. he was waiting for the helicopter because he had about 20 seconds. If you listen to the recording, the helicopter's going overhead 20 seconds. So the helicopter <laughs> kind of bailed him out. It bought him a little time to try and think of something. And <laughs> that's what he came up with. Well, they. He just didn't have it bought, the intellect. It bought him time to dig the hole deeper. That's <laughs> why. Just, that's what happened. The women just weren't articulate enough. Go ahead. What? Oh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's amazing. Amazing. And uh, when he's asked to clean that up, he's given a chance to clean that up and uh, does not do a great job. It's not articulate enough on an no, intellect. No, 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 what no, do you no, mean? No, no. Hold on a second. 
Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'll let you rephrase that. All right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. So he says, I'm going to let you rephrase that. So he, he throws him a lifeline. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a mulligan on that. Let's see where he goes now. None of them. I thought could get to <clears throat> the, I mean, Joni Mitchell. Yes. I mean, I mean, let me just see. It's, it's not that they're not creative geniuses. It's not right. that they're inarticulate, although go have a deep conversation with Grace Slick or Janice. Please be my guest. Or Cass, Elliot, wonderful person. You know, Joni was not a philosopher of rock and roll. She didn't, in my mind, meet that test, not by her work, not by other interviews. She did. The people I interviewed were the kind of philosophers of rock. The, the, of the black artists, I mean, it's, you know, Stevie Wonder, Crowley, you know, they're genius writers. These are genius artists. <clears throat> I mean, I suppose when you use a word as broad as the masters, the fault is using that word, you know, but uh, maybe Marvin Gaye, you just, I could cut Curtis Mayfield or, I mean, they just didn't articulate at that level. You know? So then he well, goes had- back. So the, he says the women didn't articulate at that level. The guy says, whoa, whoa, you can't say that. Come on. You want to take a do-over on that? Sure. Uh, the black artist did not articulate on that level either. Like, what? Like, <laughs> what a fucking what idiot. I still got more. I still <laughs> yeah. got more. I mean, whoa. what a fucking imbecile. And what are you talking about? Like I said, that Marvin Gaye, that whole album was nothing if not a zeitgeist album. Stevie Wonder. I mean, obviously Curtis. But like, what? Like, what are you even talking about? What are you even talking what? about? Hendrix. You, I, I, mean, I mean, these interviews you, took place a long time ago. Obviously, uh, you know, Wenner's an old man. So Hendrix, yeah, he'd have had a chance to interview Hendrix. Um, why not? That like, it's just like there. There's no. There's no making this sound like anything but just just an outrageously out of touch hypocrite who has built his brand on being this you know anti-establishment left winger turned you know woke democrat woke lib uh man you you talk about just an absolute train wreck of an answer well we'll let the rest of this play for a few seconds and i'll toss to you you know if you didn't give him a chance to because i read their, i read i read interviews with them i i, I listen to their music I know you can know, intuit from the music and the lyrics they write, the kind of things they're writing about. I mean, look at what Townsend was writing about, or Jagger is writing, or any of them were writing about. And that doesn't make sense either. I mean, yeah, look, Rolling the look, the, the the Stones, you know, uh, had some zeitgeist tunes. So did the Who, you know. So so did uh, so did uh, Bob Dylan, obviously. Springsteen, I mean, Springsteen, not particularly. I mean, great songwriter, obviously. But this whole critique, like you had to be tapped into what was going on. I mean, The Dead, I love The Grateful Dead. I love Springsteen, a lot of his stuff. But the idea that, and certainly like you too, like the idea that they are more emblematic of the times than Joplin or Hendrix or Marvin Gaye is just absolutely ludicrous for anybody to say, much less the founder of Rolling Stone magazine and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, so he starts the magazine uh, in his he's in his twenties, right? When yep. he starts, when he when he starts Rolling Stone, right? So you would think that somebody in their twenties at that time what was that sixty nine? Is that when the, the they they published the first one? But you would think somebody in their twenties at that 16, time, I think, yeah, yeah, you would think somebody in their twenties at that time would be in touch with everything that was going on, not just certain things. Uh, I don't know the man's background, like how he grew up or whatever. Uh, I mean, he could have been, you know, taught these things. But like I said, I don't know his background or anything like that. It just seems like if you fast forward now, he's 76 years old and uh, he just, you know, he don't really he doesn't really have any attachments anymore to. I mean, I, I don't know if he's still affiliated with Rolling Stone. I know he's not with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame anymore, but. Well, they it kicked him off like of the board, but no, he's still affiliated with with Rolling Stone. There's some people in the chat saying, did this happen 50 years ago? No, this interview just came out last right. week. This was a a book of interviews with these major artists over the years, many of which did happen, you know, in the late 60s or early 70s period and a little bit later just, as well. This just seems like something like, like an older boomer would come to in their lives because you saw a lot of the people in the 60s the boomers who were 
you had the flower power they were all about the peace movements and stuff like that and now you you know fast forward to 2023 these are the same people who are pushing for world war three right so oh, yeah, of course you yeah. know it's a good in, point in a matter of 50 50 some odd years you know how how much does a man change maybe he didn't maybe he didn't feel that way at all maybe he was at the time thought that he was going to start something big and just be involved in everything and then just i don't i don't know why it really doesn't make any sense why you would say that now unless you had nothing left to lose right i guess he doesn't feel like he's going to be canceled right I, he doesn't seem like he cares well he was canceled i mean he was taken off of the uh board of directors of the rock and roll hall of fame for this and then he did come out and say he was sorry but you know the other ironic thing is if you read the whole interview because i did read the whole interview they talk early in the interview about back when he used to interview these iconic artists um he would allow them to go back and edit the transcripts of the interviews before they went to prints he did that as a courtesy to them you know what i mean like and you know he claims that he didn't let them change the substance of their answers if they were touching on a hot topic but like if they wanted to clean up wording or whatever he would give them like a second pass at it and the, the irony is man could he have used a second pass at this like if they had extended that same courtesy to him he could have really used it because they were not as kind because this was not live streamed or anything this was pre-recorded and transcribed uh and all that stuff but the other thing they got into early in the interview because i made a joke last it was a couple shows back about because rolling stone published that expose so-called on jimmy fallon right for the abuse of workers or whatever and i just made the joke that like rolling stone doesn't break much news they mostly just put out five-star reviews of mediocre u2 albums and russell laughed at that joke but one <laughs> of the things that they mentioned in here was that uh rolling stone uh gave five-star review to a uh, i forget what the name of the mick jagger solo album was but it was uh, thought to be a pretty mediocre like solo project of Mick Jagger's. And Wenner actually went and changed the review from four stars to five stars because he had a relationship with Mick Jagger. So it is true. like They do play favorites. Because I, I noticed that even as a casual reader of the magazine back when I was a little younger, every Springsteen album, every U2 album, every Dylan album, whether it was good or not, and I listened to a lot of those artists, and they've put out some great stuff in their later years and some not so great stuff. So I'm not saying it's all trash. But whether it was good or not, it was five stars every time. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And so they definitely played favorites. They definitely lacked journalistic integrity, even as, you know, a fairly low stakes, you know, uh, outlet reviewing, you know, CDs and movies. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sure he did that as, uh, what is it, uh, access journalism. So he can make sure to keep those uh, legends in the, in the fold in case he, uh, you know, you know to, to you know for clout too probably but uh but yeah i mean i don't know yeah it no just like seems... bono was to jan winner what aoc is to ryan grimm you know you got to keep him in your, in your inner circle <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i i grew i grew up with you two and uh eh, you know i'm sorry i mean they're okay but i mean you, you put him in the ranks of like you know these other cats these these other legends and now when you see what Bono's been doing recently, you're like, ah, that's okay. Uh, I'm done with you two. I'll just listen to uh, uh, Rattle and Hum and previous stuff, and then I'll be A-OK. -okay. Please clap.